Well, I'm glad to see some, uh, some familiar faces. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is, is um, uh, run through the, through the poster uh, that you see on, on your screen. And the core of, the, core of it is a, is a model um, that has been under development for the past couple of years, um, all based on our experience with uh, Okalawa Flow Lab. Um, so um, you might or you might not know um, that what we do is we provide environments in which uh, people can experience agility and through that experience uh, learn uh, and then hat tip to, uh, to Mike who, uh, um, who is on the call and, and um, kind of put uh, uh, a lot of this in, in motion of, uh, of what we do. Um, and so um, this gives people an experience, uh, but then we also want to provide models uh, that allows people to capture that experience. And one of the mo those models is, um, is uh, a model that I, uh, that I think captures uh, context um, and that we use uh, quite a bit in, um, in coaching and, and, uh, and training. Um, now, I'm gonna start with a, uh, an, um, a clean question. Uh, and um, just as a warm up. So if you go to uh, Mentimeter, the, uh, of which the link should be in the chat, uh, or if not, just menti.com and then type in the code and then just uh, quickly. I've put it in the chat. Okay. I don't see it coming. Sorry, let me send it again. Okay, there it is. Yeah, you should have it, sorry. And so then should... just quickly in, uh, in a few words, uh, when you are working at your best, it is like what? Cool. Um, so this is um, this is an exercise that um, we often do at the beginning of a of a workshop. Um, and the thing that um, um, also here right, it's very representative. The thing that um, that comes out quite um, consistently is uh, this notion of uh, flow. Uh, this notion of um, uh, of uh, being in the zone, yeah. So that's that's quite consistently that co what yeah, something that comes out as as really core. Yeah? Um, so we, it appears that um, it appears that um, we do feel a need when we are working. Uh, we feel the need for this notion of um, uh, effortless action. Yeah? We feel the need to be in the zone. Um, we, we feel the need to be in this uh, flow state uh, or uh, what also sometimes is called this notion, this state of, uh, of effortless, uh, effortless action. That seems to be a very uh, core uh, or deep, uh, deep need. Yeah. Um, so it's so deep uh, that uh, this is not, not recent then. Uh, the picture here is a, is a picture that is uh, sometimes used by people that talk about effortless action. Of a uh, of a butcher in uh, ancient China um, that is able to carve a uh, a uh, an ox uh, without touching any of the hard parts of the ox. Uh, he, he has become so good at it that he doesn't need to sharp his knife um, even after years of years of uh, using it. And so that's that idea of effortless action. The ox almost falls apart. Uh, you see just how you need to carve it without 
having to make make some uh, some conscious effort. Um, so that's this this core belief, um, and that not only applies to the individual level. Uh, um, it also is an, is an interesting concept, also at the uh, organizational level. Yeah, uh, this idea of an organization, a team, or an organization that is able to uh, adapt to the circumstances um, very effortlessly, uh, um, without internal friction, um, uh, just being adapted to the situation um, in a very, very natural, uh, very natural way. Uh. So it's not just that effortlessness uh, is important for organizations in terms of if you have many people that are in this state of uh, in the zone that they're very productive, but it's also very relevant at the organizational level um, itself. Um, now, um, if this is so attractive, um, what then is the problem? If this is very attractive and it's also very akin to, or very, uh, very core to what uh, what we think of agility yeah, as being very naturally being adapted to the situation at hand, if that is the I uh, dislike this deep desire, um, what is the what is the um, the challenge that we're facing here? Um, now, uh, the challenge obviously is that we all know that. Uh, the state of actual effortless action is not easily to, easy to come by, right? Uh, the harder you try, yeah, um, the less likely it is that you, uh, you uh, end up in this state. Yeah? And this has to do with uh, how the brain functions. Um, um, uh, in terms of, uh, we think with our brain, obviously, and, and our brain uh, functions in terms of frames, uh, Things that frames that, that help us to perceive the world eh, that get, give us a, a certain perception of the world, and those frames are triggered by words, for example. Eh, they're, they're not conscious; they're unconsciously triggered. For example, triggered by words. And the thing is, even if you negate the frame, eh, uh, then that frame is also triggered, right? Uh, so if I uh, say, "Don't think of an elephant," this is by uh, uh, by, uh, by the way, the title of the book of uh, George Lakoff, don't think of an elephant, um, then there's a big chance that what happens is that you're starting to, to think about an elephant, right? Yeah. So even if I negate the frame, uh, then typically that frame gets, gets triggered. And the more I negate that frame, the more that frame gets triggered, right? And so effortless action, yeah, uh, being able to be in that state, uh, the more I think about not trying, yeah, because I, I, it's effortless, eh? so it's about not trying. And the more I, I think about not trying, the more the, the frame of trying is, uh, is being activated. And we all know, I don't have to explain that, eh? you uh, intuitively know how hard it is to get, to get into, uh, into that state. And so that's, that's kind of the paradox eh, of, of this effortless action. And I would, uh, by extension, would say that is, that is the paradox also of agility. Uh, the harder you try, the less likely it is that uh, you end up in that uh, state. Uh, it's very hard to try not to try. Yeah. Um, now, people don't like uh, paradox. Uh, just like we don't like uncertainty, we don't like paradox. And so what typically happens when, we, we, when a, a deep paradox like that is encountered is that um, um, this, is, uh, this leads to uh, polarization. Polarization typically in, in an action and a counter reaction. Uh, in this case, uh, again, hat, hat tip to, uh, to Mark <laughs> um, for, um, for pointing out uh, uh, this world, world of methodology uh, on LinkedIn. Um, so uh, polarization in an action and a counter reaction uh, in the sense that um, so um, the paradox collapses, uh, and in this case, uh, in the agile world, it has collapsed into two uh, dominant ways of thinking. Uh, one is uh, um, we try to avoid the paradox uh, by just ignoring it uh, and saying, um, well, um, people do need guides. Uh, people do need guidelines in terms of how to become agile. 
Uh, and so we provide those guides and those guidelines by means of methods, right? Uh, because in the end, we need some uh, we need some guides and some guidelines in terms of how to become agile uh, or how to uh, um, uh, how to be agile. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, uh, we have shunned the paradox uh, by by methods, and sometimes that methods those methods uh, have, uh, to a certain extent have has turned into methodolatry, yeah? uh, worship of methods, um, and then the counter reaction. And and I'm I'm in search for a better word for that, uh, but uh, I've put the term emergentism in there. Uh, I'm a little bit in search for a better term. So if anybody can can uh, can point out a better term. Uh, this strong belief, it's a little bit of a counter reaction to, uh, to methods, this strong belief in terms of we can capture, uh, organize uh, complex social behavior just by principles and simple rules, right? Um, so it's a counter reaction to the, to the very extensive methods. And um, so a counter reaction to that, uh, um, the belief that, and sometimes the really virulent belief that we can capture uh, or organize social behavior and sometimes complex social behavior just by providing very simple rules. Uh, now both, uh, both to a certain extent, um, uh, shun the, or, or shy away from the paradox. Eh? Um, the methodology shies away uh, by, um, by telling people what to do, right? just clearly telling people what to do, ignoring context. Eh? Um, and then uh, the villain believe in simple rules um, uh, shies away from it in terms of um, um, just like putting um, the the ideal of uh, effortless action just as a as a dogma there, uh, um, and so also in a sense it, it shies away from uh, from really staring the paradox uh, into. Um, into um, into the eye, right? Um, now both uh, both have been instrumental in the spread of agility, uh, but both to a certain extent um, are very extreme extreme uh, positions. Uh, now most of the people, uh, and I assume that uh, uh, most of the people here in the uh, in the presentation um, will be more like. Uh, uh, by conceptual, eh? not not uh, not uh, leaning to any any extreme, but more like by conceptual. Sometimes we lean to the methodology side, and sometimes we lean to the emergentist side, uh, depending on the context. Uh, we flip flop. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so we flip flop, um, and so, um, uh, but. Uh, I think there's a better way of of uh, of, uh, of dealing with it, and a, a way that takes context seriously, right? And that yeah, quantum superposition <laughs> um, takes context seriously, and then uh, helps us to uh, to better deal with that uh, with that paradox. And that's what I call agility in the flesh. It's agility that is really embodied, uh, uh, and um, that's really um, uh, lived through. Yeah. And so uh, um, we try to capture that by a model, which is um, maybe a little bit um, uh, of, a, of, a, of a challenge. Uh, uh, and there's a danger that, uh, uh, that people will say like, yeah, uh, you're, you're, um, you're critiquing methodology and then you're providing your own model. Uh, but I hope to show that um, uh, it's a, of a different kind of nature. Right, of a different kind of nature. It captures more of the mindset rather than the recipes. Okay. Now, if I take that, um, that, para, uh, that, uh, that polarization, uh, that polarization in methodology and emergentism, um, we, can, um, we can start analyzing um, from two perspectives. Uh, we can start analyzing it from the perspective of methods, from the methodology express perspective, and we can start analyzing from the perspective of emergentism, uh, the belief in vir uh, the virulent belief in simple rules. Um, but um, uh, as will become apparent, uh, 
where we start from, it doesn't matter. We will end up in the same place. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from the side of metals. Yeah? I'm going to start for the, from the side of metals. Uh, so this is my simple definition of metals. Um, so uh, a fixed set of practices uh, and principles uh, with the underlying assumption that if you um, apply the practices while respecting the principles that you uh, uh, create a certain outcome. So that's the promise of metals. Eh? They promise you uh, to be able to, um, to leverage past experience um, that is codified into practices and principles. And then uh, if you apply the practices respecting the principles, uh, you'll get some uh, outcome. For example, applying the scrum practices while respecting the, the, the agile principles, um, according to Jeff Sutherland, um, uh, produces a higher, uh, a substantially higher level of productivity. And so that's the, the point. Okay. Now, the truth of the matter, uh, the truth of the matter is that even if we respect the principles, uh, practices only produce outcomes in a certain context. Uh, so context is, uh, is important. Um, implementing Scrum in a, um, in a startup uh, where people have a very high level of engineering capabilities uh, uh, that do all the continuous integration, uh, test-driven development practices, uh, it's going to be quite different uh, from implementing Scrum in a... Um, uh, in a large organization uh, in legacy code where you might not even be able to ponder about uh, some of the engineering. Uh, so context, uh, context is important. Um, introducing agile engineering practices in a, in a non-agile organization uh, with non-agile uh, HR practices will create friction. Okay? Um, so it's not the people that create the friction in this uh, in this type of thinking. Uh, it's the the mismatch between context and the practices that you're introducing. Uh, it's that mismatch that uh, that creates friction. So take note of the the, the notation that I'm using in the uh, uh, right bottom corner of your uh, of your screen. Uh, so practices produce an outcome. Uh, inhibited, or as we will say later on, uh, enabled uh, by a certain context. Uh, um, so here uh, we are using a notation that is not uh, uh, where we, we're not just taking uh, uh, the causality into relationship, but we also take the context in which certain cause effects take place. We, we also make that context uh, explicit. Yeah. Um, so this is the inhibiting part. Now, the good news is that some uh, practices also enable, um, and that uh, requires a little bit of uh, terminological change in the sense that uh, many of what we call practices are actually constraints. Um, uh, so I quickly uh, went into this, uh, this uh, session uh, just before this one, uh, where she was talking about enabling constraints. Um, so some of the, what we call practices are actually constraints. Uh, uh, if we look at uh, time, box, time boxes uh, like sprint, uh, which we call, uh, call a practice is actually a constraint or in the terminology of Kanban, where we look at whip limits as a practice, um, uh, a whip limit is actually a constraint. And so rather than limiting uh, these constraints and despite the, the naming, uh, these constraints enable or catalyze a certain, uh, a certain capability. Um, for example, uh, time box constraints, why do we uh, uh, put so much uh, emphasis on time box constraints in Scrum? Yeah, because we want to enable uh, fast learning, right? Because we want to enable fast feedback. It doesn't guarantee that we uh, learn fast, right? because we might still time box and not listen to our customer, eh? but it makes the chance of uh, you learning faster uh, uh, dramatically bigger. Eh? Same goes for uh, whip limits, right? Um, so um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't guarantee that you will defer commitment, eh? but it enables you to defer the commitment. And with deferring commitment, I mean, 
not committing um, uh, too early, not committing work too early, uh, but committing work um, uh, at a, uh, to the point where it's actually uh, 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 being, we are able to, to deliver it in a, in a reasonable and a sh reasonably short lead time, right? So we permits do not guarantee that you'll, you'll not defer commitment, but actually uh, um, uh, enable it, uh, uh, make your, your chances of, of uh, being able to do it uh, bigger, right? Patrick, sorry, just to let you know, you've got a bit less than 10 minutes before yes. the end. Thanks. Um, so um, now constraints like loop limits and time box constraints, uh, they uh, expose attention. Right. Uh, for example, if I take whip constraints, um, they expose a tension between the desire for short lead times and the need to keep everybody busy. Right. And that tension tends to serve to surface as a resistance to change, but it's a, a real tension that is there in the organization. Right. We want to have short lead times, but at the other hand, uh, um, uh, idle time is still a big taboo in uh, in most organizations, and that tension is surfaced by uh, constraining the whip, right? Um, so luckily, uh, certain patterns have emerged. Uh, for example, in the Kanban community, the pattern has emerged uh, of um, uh, certain practices that help to improve, to reduce the tension, for example, by uh, better managing blockers to reduce uh, any impediments. We can still uh, limit the whip, constrain the whip, uh, turn this number, uh, the whip policy, the number on top of the board into a real constraint, to an effective constraint, uh, because by reducing the impediments, we can we can safely limit, uh, reduce uh, reduce the whip without introducing idle time, right? So that's the practice that emerged. Um, so practices that um, reduce the tension. Uh, that turn a policy to, into an effective constraint that allows the realization of an outcome. And that outcome, uh, uh, if consistently produced, enables a certain capability. In this case, the capability to defer commitment. Right? So that's a pattern that emerged. Uh, now, similar patterns have emerged uh, in other communities. Uh, in the Scrum community, for example, this pattern has uh, emerged to uh, increase our optionality uh, at the beginning of a sprint. Uh, so that we can commit to a time box, um, so that we can predictably frequent, uh, frequent predictably frequent deliver uh, work, so that we can have frequent integration, so that we can have fast feedback. Right. So that's the pattern that emerged into the in the Scrum community. Um, another pattern that has emerged in the Agile community at large is uh, we synchronize our say cadences, uh, so that we can. Uh, Collaborate more closely into small in small cells in small teams, uh, and why do we want to do that? Well, we want to increase our uh, uh, staff liquidity, or in other words, uh, overlapping comp competencies, uh, so that we can collaboratively improve. So those are uh, different patterns that have emerged uh, in different places, uh, each leading to uh, as the core the core of a certain method. Uh, slow pattern as the core of the Kanban method, uh, the learning pattern as the core of the Scrum methods, uh, the collaboration pattern, uh, a little bit uh, more of, an, of a generic agile pattern. Um, so those are patterns that have merged and that provide us a, of a cat for, with a catalog of, um, of different ways of achieving agility. Now, the question is, which pattern is the true pattern of agility? Which pattern is the true pattern of agility? Right. Now, in order to um, to answer that question, we need to go back to uh, this uh, uh, the other side, the emergentist side, the believe in simple rules, uh, where we often use this picture of a flock of birds, uh, where we have this belief that we can have simple rules to organize complex social behavior. Uh, we often uh, refer to flocks swarming. Um, uh, uh, termite hills, stuff like that. Uh, so in, a, in an act of biomimicry, uh, so in an act of uh, inspiring ourselves by the way nature is organized, 
we organize uh, we organize uh, the structure of an organization uh, based on on uh, on similar principles. Yeah? So that's kind of uh, in a nutshell what what is happening in like. Oftentimes, this is under the umbrella of no scaling or descaling, uh, stuff like that, right? Um, now, the truth of the matter is that if you uh, look at life, um, is that life is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, uh, and I want to, um, I want to uh, leave it in the middle where it's complicated or complex. Eh? Uh, but there's more to life than just a, a couple of simple rules, right? Um, there is DNA. Uh, and while DNA might be based on a limited number of building blocks, DNA itself has a quite complex structure. Right? Uh, and that DNA uh, organizes networks, uh, like uh, here, um, yeah, whatever. Um, this is the uh, metabolic cycle network uh, in hierarchies and in large diversity, right? Now, the point is, it's more than a couple of simple rules. Right. And I hope um, that organizations uh, are more like uh, a living organism rather than an anthill, right? An anthill does show maybe a very spectacular behavior, uh, but maybe it's not that very intelligent, yeah. Uh, now, if you look at uh, life, then um, a core concept that uh, seems to recur is, um, is this concept of networks of chemical reactions that provide a context to themselves. Right? So what I mean by that is that chemical reactions also need to be enabled, catalyzed. Yeah? Um, and those enablers are not part of the, the, the chemical reaction itself yeah? because they form a context for the chemical reaction. And what seems to be uh, recurrent in uh, chemical reactions that are the basis for life are reactions that create their own context, that create their own, their own enablers, right? Um, now, if we put that together uh, with our notion of patterns, um, then I think we come a little bit closer to uh, a core uh, model for agility that more resembles the DNA rather than just simple rules, okay? rather than just simple rules, okay? And the observation is that if you look at the core patterns, the three patterns that I, that I just uh, mentioned, is that not only can you say that each of these patterns has its applicability in a certain context, yeah? but these patterns provide a context for each other. These patterns enable each other. Okay, so I think I don't have to explain how the team pattern, yeah, the pattern of collaboration, provides a context for the, the, the scrum pattern of learning. I think that's quite clear. Yeah? Uh, Self-organizing teams are quite crucial to, um, uh, to the concept of time boxing in, uh, in scrum. What might be less clear is how the scrum pattern of learning enables the Kanban pattern of flow and how that Kanban pattern of flow enables the team pattern of collaboration. Now, assuming that this is the case, assuming that these patterns enable each other, um, then obviously that is very good news yeah, because now we have a system where um, we can create a context for one pattern by introducing another pattern. Okay. Yeah, which is a very powerful idea if you think about introducing change in an organization. Yeah. But now the notion of context is something that you have uh, in your own in your own hand. Yeah. Patrick, sorry, just to let you know we're reaching the end of the session. Yeah. Yes. So uh, together they form the patterns. Uh, in in that. If you look at it this way, the, the patterns perform uh, a generative language uh, in the sense that they're very generic. Yeah? Uh, just if you take just the constraints, uh, there's lots of, uh, if you think of the patterns as the grammar of the language, then the vocabulary in the language, there's a very rich vocabulary. If you just think about the constraints, you can think about cap whip, con whip, personal whip, order points, cap tokens, 
uh, cross functional teams, pairing, mobbing, branding, stop the line, uh, sprint time boxing, task time boxing. Uh, there's many different words that you can plug into that uh, into that grammar. Yeah, and then if you think about Scrum, then Scrum is only one sentence, or Kanban is only one sentence. So clearly, there's a, a very um, a way richer set of sentences that we have not explored yet when we talk about agility. And that brings it back to making context explicit yeah? because now we can, prov if, if you follow that grammar, if you know that grammar, if you know that language, you can, you can write your own sentences that are more appropriate to, to context. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what we capture in the, uh, in the agile capabilities model. Um, uh, so is, uh, is how those patterns fit to each other. And so clearly I don't have the time to, uh, to explain that. Uh, uh, but um, um, so that's that's uh, but that's how the model uh, what the model provides uh, is uh, is an insight in how those patterns uh, 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 function together. Yeah. Now it's a model, uh, so all models are wrong. Uh, some are useful, um, and so I hope that uh, people start breaking it. Uh, that's but that's not the point. Uh, the point is that uh, the notion of Having different patterns that enable each other, and then the term, the the notation of uh, using constraints as an enable for enabler for uh, for practices. So that's that's a, a very practical uh, practical thing to do in terms of uh, thinking about how you engender change in um, in an organization. Um, so the uh, oops, oh. sorry. I'm gonna just, so we'll, we'll leave up the poster for downloads. Uh, so um, the QR code, and then if there's any questions, uh, feel free uh, 